I remember before going into nursing school and before becoming a nurse, and I was talking with my wife about this the other day, about how I used to go to these BLS classes and think, I wonder if anybody's actually ever done compressions on a real live human. You know, like, do people really do that or is this just something that they, they do to keep us excited? But I will tell you, as an experienced nurse, that you will provide CPR at some point. You will do, at a minimum, BLS. If you work ED, ICU, you will do ACLS. And even if you're not ACLS certified, as a nurse on a floor, you're BLS certified and you can be involved in a full code providing compressions. So it's very important that you understand BLS and realize that ACLS starts with good BLS. New guidelines emphasize the importance of quality compression and early defibrillation. The AHA even rearranged the CPR order sequence from ABC to CAB. Since the priority for cardiac arrest patients is to get blood perfusing again as quickly as we can. Compressions are high quality when given at a rate of 100 to 120 minute per minute and a depth of two inches, allowing for the chest to completely recoil. That's trying to get that full pump. Luckily, there are all ways to monitor compression quality. If a patient is intubated, we can place a small device on the end of the ETT endotracheal tube, which measures pressure of end tidal CO2, or the pressure of the excelled uh, carbon dioxide. If PETCO, or pressure of end tidal CO2, is less than 10 millimeters of mercury, compressions are inaccurate. We're not pushing, allowing the patient to recoil and get enough CO2 out. If we're lucky enough to have an arterial line, we watch diastolic pressure to make sure it's greater than 20 millimeters of mercury. Another point to remember is to always start with CPR for two minutes. Then, if the rhythm is shockable, shock. And then immediately return to CPR, minimizing interruptions and compressions. For shockable rhythms, two shocks are administered before drugs. For non-shockable rhythms, drugs can be given after the first two minute cycle of CPR. Finally, Remember when ROSC or return of spontaneous compression is achieved, the patient will need a maintenance strip of any antiarrhythmic that worked for them during CPR, usually cortisone. And I want you guys to study this chart very closely uh, and realize that when a code occurs or when a patient crashes, it's too late to need to, to, to learn what to do, okay? You might be alone with that patient if you are, get on the chest and start doing compressions. You will do CPR as a nurse. At some point in your career, you may do it a lot. The longest code I was ever involved in was in a cath lab. Uh, we could not get this patient to convert. The, the interventional cardiologist was putting sheaths in, trying to get him. We were, we were doing compressions. We were giving every med we could, and we were just trying to get this patient back. He'd had a, a spontaneous, obviously, heart attack. Uh, come in, otherwise healthy 57-year-old male, no history of coronary event, came in and we just could not convert. After a couple hours, uh, we had to call it uh, and the physician had to go talk to the family and tell them, uh, you know, that their dad, who had just had dinner with them that night, had passed away. But we did everything we could. We followed protocol. We've had, I've had other codes where things work out perfectly. We run a perfect code, patient comes back. Other ones where it doesn't go quite so well. But if you don't know what to do, get in there and do compressions. As a nursing student, you're BLS certified. Do compressions. Get in there, become comfortable with the environment, become comfortable with what's going on, and, and try to perform as many, and get involved in as many as you can, because that's where you're gonna learn. That's where you're gonna see the team, the medical team come together, and you're gonna see how this all plays in, and you're gonna learn how these drugs and these medications work for this patient.